hello and welcome to this, what will be more like a workshop, I guess, um, for all of the wonderful teachers from the Inner Circle Facebook group. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Claire Venables, and I've been dedicated to English language teaching for 19 years now. Um, some things you might not know about me is that I actually started out in Spain. I spent a decade in Spain before moving to Brazil nine years ago. And over the years, I've actually taught every level and age, but I've always been most interested in language learning and teaching in childhood. It's um, what I work with exclusively now as a teacher trainer and materials writer. But anyone who knows me will probably tell you that. I am all about connecting, uh, connecting with other ELT professionals to help strengthen and grow our teaching community. And that's why I've been aiming to achieve with Active English and the Inner Circle. So that's why it is such a pleasure to be with you all here tonight. And I'm honoured that so many people have shown up to hear what I have to say about something I think is more important than ever. And that's play-based learning. So I actually started talking about this over on my Instagram account a little while ago. And I have to tell you, I was pretty amazed at just how much of a buzz this topic created. Um, there seem to be many different ideas about what play-based learning is and how it looks in a language classroom. Okay. So this, like I said, is a free webinar for the members of the Inner Circle and it is on play-based lessons online. And specifically what we're going to be looking at in this session um, is, well, this is what I'd like to do. Tonight, tonight I'd like to provide a practical example of how teacher -led, a teacher-led activity can provide the language support that students need for free play. And I think the best way to illustrate that is by getting you to do one with me. I'm gonna show you some of the results from my classroom. Um, and this is the reason why I really believe this works, not just in theory, but in practice as well. Then we're gonna define what play and play-based learning is in the early childhood and primary years context. And then I'm going to advocate for and explain how we use free play in language lessons. And then it's gonna be your turn. I'd love to hear ideas from you about how we can take this to our online lessons. And I'm gonna share some of my ideas as well. So um, I think it would be really important in this speak up section of our, our, um, our session tonight to also discuss some of the perceived and often very real obstacles to, to why teachers don't integrate free play. I don't want anyone leaving here saying, that sounds great, Claire, but I can't because. I want us to have a look at some of these obstacles because I think we can and we must overcome them. We've got to let them play. Of course, it wouldn't be a workshop with me if we didn't end on some kind of look to the future. I want to see what our next steps might be. I really want to work out how we can make this work online. I'm not claiming tonight to be an expert in this. In fact, I don't think anyone is. Nobody really has a lot of experience uh, teaching uh, in, during a pandemic. But let's as a community make play a priority. Like I said, I haven't come up with any definitive uh, solutions that are going to work in every single context. I still have many, many questions about how we can provide meaningful, rich, free play experiences for children to learn English while we're still teaching remotely. I do know, however, that we can and we must find a way to do this. Children need to be playing. And so I'm so happy that I can count on the people in this community. Um, and let's make this a jump off point for a much bigger discussion in our group. In this session, you're going to be working with the people in this group. So if you haven't already, please take a minute to say hi and introduce yourself in the comments box. You probably have already seen a lot of people that you know, which is lovely. Go and give a little shout out to your friends who you can see participating this evening. And while you do, I'm going to call on or call for some volunteers. I need some volunteers who actually have their materials with them. So I'm gonna check out the, I'm gonna take a quick look. This activity that I'm going to actually 
um, do with you, let me show you what it is that we're going to do. Let me start off by saying that the activities that I'm going to show you, the reason that I've chosen these is first of all, there are some games and play that I have used with learners of all different ages and all different proficiency levels. And what I love about them uh, is that they stimulate a child's creativity and an adult's creativity too. They also develop critical thinking skills and problem solving. They're developmentally inclusive and they provide an opportunity for emergent language. So if you've got your materials, you're ready to go, let's, have, let's start off by watching a video. So we're going to watch this video. It is an animation based on a beautiful story called Not A Box. So this story, like I said, is called Not A Box. And look at this lovely little character we've already been introduced to. It's a little rabbit. What do you think his name is? John. It's John? What do you think his name is, Lucy? Um, Peter. Peter. What do you think his name is, Brenda? Uh, Mr. Rabbit. <laughs> Mr. Rabbit. Let's see. <laughs> it, it might be any or all of these options. Let's watch the video and find out. Oh. Why are you sitting in a box? Not a box. It's not a box. What is it? Shout out the answer for me. It's a car. A race car. A race yes, car. it's a race car. Oh. Okay. Hmm. What are you doing on top of that box? It's not a box. Oh, what do you think it is now? Oh, what is it? It's a mountain. It's a mountain. <laughs> yes. Hmm. Why are you squirting the box? I wonder what this is going to be. I said it's not a box. What is it? Shout out the answer. It's a building on fire. That's right. Now you're wearing a box? This is not a box. Hmm. What is it? A robot. A robot. A robot. A robot. That's right. <laughs> hmm. Are you still standing around in that box? It's not, 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 not a box. <laughs> Well, what is it then? It's my not a box. Spaceship. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's a not a box. The end. If you like the story, clap your hands. I absolutely adore that little animation. And let me tell you why. I think this really, for me, it connects with something that is so beautiful and true about what we can observe in children when they play. They have this amazing ability to, with very simple materials and something as simple as a box or perhaps you've maybe watched a child at play and seen how they can take a stick or a stone that they find in the playground or in the garden and they can turn it into like endless number of things. So in the lessons that I do or the lesson that I'm or the activities that I'm presenting today, I'm starting with this story because I think the story provides a great jump off point. It ignites um, a lots of different ideas. And have any of you started looking a little bit differently at the box that you have in with you that I've asked you to bring along? 
suddenly mm -hmm. can you think that perhaps this box might not be a box hmm we're going to play a game now okay. and this is a teacher-led game it's called it's not a box and i'm going to start by modeling what it is that we have to do and we're going to repeat those steps over and over again with each of you the game is very very simple um, I'm going to start by teaching you the language that we're going to use and I would do this explicitly with my group as well. It starts off like this. What's this? And can everybody say, it's a box? It's, it's a box. Not. No, 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 no. It's not a box. And I'd like you all to say, well, what is it? Well, well what, what is, is it? it? It's a hat. <laughs> Let's practice that language again. Okay. What's this? It's, it's not. a box. No, 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 no. It's not a box. Well, what is it? It's a hat. And I want to hear you all go, ah. That's right. Brenda, it's your turn. So Brenda's going to now take on the role okay. of the teacher and Brenda will say, what's this? What's this? It's, it's a, a box. box. No, it's not a box. Everybody? Well, well what is, is it? it? It's a treasury box. Oh. oh. Lucy, it's your turn. What's this? It's Everybody? A box. It's a box. It's a box. No, 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 no. It's not a box. Well, well, well what, what is, is it? That? It's a rabbit. Oh! oh. Rabbit. Diana, it's your turn. What is it? It's Everybody a box. box. No, no, no. It's not a box. Well, well what, is, what it? is it? Binoculars. Oh. <laughs> oh. Sylvia. What's this? It's, it's a, box. a box. It's not a box. Well, well what, is, what it? is it? It's my doll wardrobe. <laughs> Oh, very good. Big round of applause for everybody. What great imagination. Now, can you remember? What's this? It's a? Hat. Yes. Uh-huh. Brenda? It's a? a treasury, treasury box. And what did Lucy have, everybody? Don't say Lucy. Can everyone remember what Lucy had? A rabbit. A, a rabbit. rabbit. Very yeah. good. And what about um, Diana? Can you remember? A doll wardrobe. Binoculars. Binoculars. No. Binoculars. No. Finally, Sylvia. What did Sylvia have? Do you remember? A doll's wardrobe. A doll's wardrobe. Yes, a Very doll's good. Wardrobe. Very good. Very creative group of teachers here, for sure. So this would be the teacher-led game. And what I want you to pay attention to about the characteristics of this game is they have role, structure, and a script. And we repeat these steps, letting each person have a turn over and over. And that, mm, that target language, we're teaching the language of play, not just vocabulary. The vocabulary that's the target vocabulary of this game is actually anything a child can imagine. So this is a really great opportunity to teach words beyond the lexical list that you might find in a course book and teach words that they wanna learn. You know, when I played this activity, we've had football stadiums, we've had refrigerators, we've had boats, we've had robots, we've had all kinds of things. And it's amazing how quickly children will learn words when they are genuinely interested in, in learning them. So what I would normally do is do a lot of correction here. I would try and get them to stick to the script so they get lots of practice. And I'll actually show you this is, this is the moment where you can give them immediate feedback on their language production. And I'd like to show you an example 
of my students playing this. It's a really, really short, short clip. Um, but I want to, it's, it's important for me to show you this and I will explain why. I'm going to open this up now. Very short clip, but I will break it down for you so you can see just, just how important this is. So you're going to see Clara. And Clara was a student who had who usually in a group activity found it very hard to speak up. She was naturally a shy student um, who it was very difficult to get Clara to, to speak uh, English in front of the group. But she was actually the last person in the circle to play this game or to have a turn. So she'd actually heard the language over and over again. And by the time um, it was her turn, I feel like she'd had enough exposure or seen and heard it enough times to have built up her confidence and we can see what she comes up with here. just adorable I just loved her I loved how confident she was when she was speaking which was the first time I had introduced this game to the kids so this is an example of how we can um, take we can use a teacher-led game which has roles structures and scripts to prepare children for a free play moment and that's what you are all going to do right now it's time for you to take that box and you've got the materials there with you and just have a play. I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep presenting um, and talking about this as we go. But as we go, I want anyone who's bought in art and craft materials and boxes tonight to feel free to play and tinker with those materials and create. And at the very end of this session, I'm going to encourage everyone who's made something to post about it in a post I'm going to leave in our, uh, in our group. And I can't wait to see what you creative people come up with. And that's exactly what I did. Let me tell you the story of this activity. Being a young learner teacher, you know what we're like, we cannot, we cannot see a box in the street or receive a delivery without looking at it. Like normal people would go, okay, it's a box. And you could just mute your mic for me, please. That'd be great. Normally, normal people would see that box and they'd say, oh, it's a box and throw it in the bin. But a young learner teacher, no, we don't do that, do we? We see that box as being something full of potential. And in, of course, at home, I have this big collection of cardboard boxes that you can see them here in this picture in the, um, on top of the yellow circle there. I had so many boxes and I didn't know what to do with these boxes. And finally, I'd found this story and I thought, hmm, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And I brought the boxes into the classroom and left them over in the corner. And the kids had come in, not even seen the boxes. And we'd started our lesson, we'd watch this video, we'd play this game. And suddenly, everybody looked over into the corner and saw the boxes and thought, hmm. And I said, go, go play. And off they went and they were playing with the boxes. They were stacking the boxes. They were knocking them over. They were saying, it's a robot. It's a house. It's, and we'd practice this language in this game before. So then very easily and naturally, I could get in amongst them and I could sort of say, oh, what's this? It's, it's not a box, obviously. What is it? And then they would tell me what they were doing and what they were playing with. And then I just pointed them in the direction of the arts and crafts table that you can see in this second picture here. And they were off, you know, then there was no stopping them. They required no prompting whatsoever. They were in amongst it, painting, drawing, cutting, tearing, sticking. And I didn't have to do a thing. They were off on their own. And um, this was a really lovely, lovely moment. Um, and I, like I said, I've done this again with lots of different groups and it's always been such a joyful, joyful lesson and a really great way of getting them to use structures that we would typically introduce in a language curriculum, wouldn't it? Like what's this, it's a, uh, it's not a, uh, the negative and affirmative sentences, um, questions with what. This is like classic from a young learner curriculum but suddenly we're introducing it in a very meaningful way and we're giving children a lot of agency um, in the choices that they make about how they use that language and um, I'd like to jump in I'm glad that we were able to, I really wanted to start off with 
with this example um, because I wanted to show you what this looks like. It can be quite an abstract notion when we talk about play and creativity in the classroom and letting children pr play freely. What does it look like? Um, and this is a classic example uh, from, from my teaching practice of what free play looks like in my classroom. And it's not a free for all. There is structure. And the structure comes through that teacher led play that we have at the beginning, which has, again, I'll, I'll, I'll quote Bruna here. Bruna refers to this as a format, these three important elements, which are roles, structures, and scripts in that game that we just played. So I want to now talk to you a little bit, get on the same page about, about play in the classroom, you know, and why we do it. When I moved away from rote learning, and I used to be that teacher, I used to be the teacher with the deck of flashcards and the blob of blue tack who would come up with all kinds of listen and repeat games. What's this? It's red, blue, it's a, it's a box it's mummy, it's daddy, using flashcards. And when I moved away from that style of teaching to play-based learning in my language lessons, it was very instinctive. Probably like a lot of you, I, I knew something was wrong with the way I was doing this. And, and it was just this constant struggle to get them to behave. And I was always doing backflips, you know, to keep them interested and motivated. And this is a, a complaint I hear from a lot of teachers, I can't motivate my kids. And we do all kinds of things. We, you know, anything to keep the kids motivated and engaged. Now, at the end of the day, all I felt like I was doing was teaching lists of words. And I wanted to go beyond teaching just the language and move towards an approach that's, uh, I guess, responsive to the de developmental needs of these kids, especially as I started teaching younger and younger children. You know, I wanted to help them develop their abilities and uh, connect with their interests and help them build on, you know, their knowledge of not just the language, but of themselves. And of course, the community that they belong to and the world that they live in. And, and all this needed to be done in a way that really engaged them on a deeper level, that evolved them and helped to develop their autonomy as lifelong learners. Because remember kids, they're at the start of their language learning journey. Now, this may seem like an incredibly unrealistic task. And there's probably teachers watching me there thinking, oh, Lord, how am I supposed to do all of this when I've got classes of 45 minutes twice a week? But it is so much simpler than you think. The answer is let them play, you know? And play, like it says in this quote, is one of the most important ways which young children gain essential knowledge and skills. One of the most important ways. All of the quotes, all of the research that I'm referring to, I am making available for people in the last slide. And I have got links to all of these free downloads. If you can, if you're interested, please go in. And this document in particular is wonderful. You're going to love it. But let's have a look now at the play continuum. Because most of us here are familiar with this idea. Children learn through play. Am I right? Yes. Yes, we all know this. And thanks to this growing body of research into both the theory and the practice of early learning, right, we have a much better understanding of how all aspects, all aspects of a child's learning is interwoven. The physical, so the fine and gross motor skills, the social, that empathy, the theory of the mind, the emotional, the development of self-regulation and even self-conscious emotions, and creative development, divergent thinking, making, expressing, all of these things are not happening in isolation. They are happening together. But what I notice is, is that many teachers, when we refer to this word play, it's very different to this idea of um, connection and this idea of everything being interwoven. We try and compartmentalize it. I want you to take a look at this graphic and tell me honestly, where on this continuum, maybe you could answer in the comments there, where on this continuum does the play you provide in your lessons fall? Now, some of these teachers who are here tonight, I know, I know where this falls for them and I know 
There are lots of wonderful examples of child-led play happening in schools all over Brazil. And I'm so glad to have these teachers in this community to help us talk about this and share their, their vast experience. But I want everybody now to just, even if you, you don't wanna answer in the comments, you don't feel comfortable doing that, that's fine. But have a look at this continuum. Everywhere from these lessons, and we know these lessons, we've been in these lessons, where there is just direct instruction, you know, from the teacher. You might be just going through the motions, doing the course book. That is not playful learning. It doesn't even come under that umbrella of playful learning. But then we do have games, like the ones that we just saw. I think that what's, it's not a box activity falls in with this idea of adult designed and scaffolded. I set the rules, I set the constraints for play, everybody follows along. It's still a lot of fun. It's still a lot of fun, but it's not quite there yet. There's also guided play. So that might have been that moment when the kids were all playing with the boxes and I was getting in and sort of prompting them, maybe directing them a little bit to use that target language, if I'm honest. Um, but again, this is sort of scaffolding them more. And then that free play moment when they could have done anything they wanted. And they did. They chose to go over to the um, craft, art and craft materials and off they went. And they were playing freely and creating with that. So where do you think your, your play, where on the continuum does it fall? And this is a really, I think, important thing for us to think about. So we're all on the same page about, about play. Um, and ultimately, I think play in our classrooms should involve some kind of agency. I think enabling children to take on that active role, that ownership in their experience. And um, it's about trusting kids too. It's about trusting that they are capable, that they're autonomous and that they can direct their own learning journey, even the littlest ones. Let's go back to the example from the beginning of the lesson. There was that clear teacher-led moment, right, where the game was introduced and it had specific roles, structures and a script all designed and scaffolded by me. And I feel like, I don't just feel, I, I've been observing a lot of teachers. I'm talking about 30 lessons a week. I've been working in teacher training for years. I have seen a lot of lessons and the most common type of play that we see in language classrooms is this, is this teacher-led um, play, games. But as we can see from this quote even, and from the large body of research that's available, this isn't enough to be considered play <laughs> learning. There is very little space for agency in that game that we did together. So what is play-based learning? Well, Rather than saying that play-based learning is something that we do, I love this quote. It says that play-based learning is actually a context that we create. I love this idea of creating a context for play. A context for learning through which children organize and make sense of their social worlds as they engage actively with people, objects, and representations. So that there encompasses all different kinds of play that you can imagine. Um, manipulative, manipulative play, sensory play, um, dramatic play, it's all there. And we want, to be, we want to be using this, we need to be using this in our classes. But how do we do that? Well, like I said, at the, like I said earlier, for me, this transition felt very intuitive. I'd worked in, early, I'd worked in preschools um, in in Australia before I moved overseas. And my mother is actually uh, an early childhood educator and my eternal inspiration. She's a wonderful educator. And um, so I kind of was leaning on, on the theory and the approaches from that background, right? But it didn't really help me when I thought about the language classroom because kids need input, right? But then I found the research from Dr. Sandy Mordone and it was everything I needed. It suggested from her research that we need a balance in our classrooms between this teacher-led play and this child-initiated play. So when we're talking about teacher-led play, let me just remind you what we're talking about is when we model language and behavior, 
when we um, support them, while we're um, interacting with them, those fun routines that we have at the start of the class, when we initiate games, that's all our teacher-led play. And the child-initiated play are those free moments when they can discover on their own, experiment, create, interact and, uh, with and support peers. And of course, make those autonomous choices, that agency that we're looking for. Great article, also linked in my references, so you can all have a read of that. Um, and then it, I, I really need to, to, I know I'm going on and on about this, but I think it's really important for us as we, if, if you're thinking of making the move to play-based teaching, you're going to come up against people who may question what it is that you're doing. Are they really learning? Well, this quote has come from Why Play Equals Learning. It's an encyclopedia of early childhood development. It's brilliant. This document presents research findings um, that are also supportive of this balance between free play and play that's been guided and scaffolded by the teacher. And it says from the, 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 the results of this research proved that in early childhood settings that had free play, children actually did better academically and socially than those that had more teacher-led, um, te a teacher, more teacher-led approach. So remember, the scaffolding and support in a language classroom means lots of opportunities to see, hear, and use that language before being expected to produce it themselves. That's another thing that I think a lot of teachers freak out about. How am I going to let them just play? They'll just use L1. And they probably will if they're not given the input first, right? So you've got to make sure that you're really providing that input and support first. And this might be through a story. You know, I've got wonderful examples of students who have basically memorized an entire story and at free play, I've actually put the lines from the story together with some of the materials that I had available for them to use and created their own little dialogues. It was just amazing. Um, I've had students do the same thing with a song, taking the lyrics of songs that we'd done over and over again and use our puppets to have a little conversation with each other. You can see, you can use that or you can give input with chants with the repetitive use of the classroom language, being mindful and consistent with the language that you use as part of your regular class routine. This is all such valuable input. And of course, the games that we play with them that they love and want to do over and over again. Now, I'm 100% positive that there is not a teacher here that doesn't use teacher-led play in their classrooms. I'm sure we all do. However, I wonder, how many of us are taking the next step and making space in their lesson plans for child initiated play? How many teachers are ready to do what Sandy Moran calls the handover? I love how visual this is, the handover. It's referring to the moment when the teacher puts the language into the hands of the learners and allows them the time and the freedom to experiment with it as they wish. It's the moment when children can use the words and phrases that they just learned or learned previously in new and creative and often very surprising ways. When provided with the right amount of support and input through the teacher-led play, children can transfer this knowledge to new contexts and use it in ways that are meaningful to them. And even if sometimes that might be a string of Portuguese or L1 with the words in English popping up there, isn't that still better than them being able to look at a whole deck of flashcards and meaninglessly recite what they are? Or when mum says, count to 10 for your grandma and a child can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, but can't count how many sweets they have in their hands. That rote learning for me is meaningless. Whereas the language that I have observed um, happening, occurring to, spontaneously during free play is meaningful. So this type of free play is commonly, it's commonly accepted in mainstream education, right? Free play, well, I won't say commonly, but in a lot of contexts that I've, I've worked in, free play is just a thing. Um, and for several reasons though, English teachers tend to shy away from it. What I'd like us to do now as a community, as a collective, is I'd like us to share 
ideas that we have, having seen these examples and listened to what I've spoken about, can we come up with activities that could link teacher-led play? Maybe it's a game that you've done lots of times with your students. Like, what's the time, Mr. Wolf, you might have done? I'm not sure. But maybe think about a teacher-led game and how could we connect that to free play, make that a free play moment as a follow-on? Have a think about it and let me know in the comments. If, if, you, um, if you have done free play and you have an example that you would like to share, I'd love to hear from you. Just raise your hand up there and, um, and I'll turn your mic on so that you can talk to the group. I can. Who's this? Sure. Is this Diana? It's Diana, yes. I'm not sure where it would fit exactly. So you may, I'll tell you the activity and you'll help me. I'm, I'm not sure if it's free play, but it's kind of. Everybody knows the very hungry caterpillar, right? After telling this story, I worked with, I gave my, we worked with the vocabulary, the fruit and the numbers. And uh, I gave my students, uh, play-doh and uh, kind of encourage them to retell the story but they had to prepare the food and they were preparing and saying uh, three apples four pears I, I can't remember how many fruit anyway after they did that i said okay we're going to eat the caterpillar is going to eat and we put the all the play-doh together and they created a big caterpillar and they started playing with them, you know, like eating. Oh, I'm going to eat this apple. Oh, two apples, three strawberries. And they were saying the words counting and saying the fruit and playing with the Play-Doh and making their own caterpillars. And so then I don't know how, where it would fit. I'll, I'll turn this over to the group. Yeah, so, it would be great. Yeah, let's let's see what the group has to say about this. So we've started off with a story. Yeah, we've moved to some teacher-led games mm -hmm. um, that hopefully had structure, sure. role, script that repeated right. Some mm -hmm. specific language there that they had an opportunity to use and and and, and hear in, in different contexts. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into also a teacher-led game, right? where yes. you said now we're going to make fruit and so mm -hmm. they had to, they were given the play-doh they were sort of given the materials they were given instructions on what they had to do and they made it and it sounds to me what do, what do you all think about that final activity i'd love to hear from people here Can I give a, for me, it's just something new for me, but it seems like it's a, a teacher-led activity. Let me, I'm going to go back to my, okay, so I'm going to try and go back here to this. Let's have a look at this. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, what ended up happening was there was this sort of natural transition where the kids actually took over, right? And they didn't keep following the instructions. Is that right? And they just yes, started doing what right. they wanted with the Play-Doh. Yeah, they, they were the Play-Dohs, they got all the fruits together and they were the caterpillars and they were playing one caterpillar with playing with the other. I'm going to eat two. I'm going to eat more strawberries, you know, the, those kind of things. But they were playing with the Play-Doh. Okay, and it, they had made, Joyce, if you want to jump in here and talk as well, I'm, I'm happy to, to share, share the mic. Yeah, um, okay, hello. Hi, Joyce. Um, so I, I have uh, tried this activity before, uh, before the pandemic. It, it works like this. The function is whose object is this? And then 
they the, the kids would choose one of their favorite objects objects at, at like school objects like a pencil or a pencil case uh, and then they would put it in a box and then they would close their eyes and they would randomly take one item from the box and they 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 would ask oh okay who's whose pencil case is this and they they would say oh it's it's gabrielle's it's uh, Layla, I mean, I don't know. And then I have tried, to, and I'm actually going to adapt this activity tomorrow because uh, some of the, their kids and the parents have already sent me uh, the photos of their objects and the kids holding them. And then uh, it's the same functions, it's just another different thing, of course. And then they're going to try and I'll try to play a memory game with them, a memory game, and they, they will try to find out whose object is this by, you know, paying attention to the photo. And then, you know, the kids are free. Sometimes they add more objects. It's very fun. Okay. And so, so Diana, I haven't forgotten about you and I'm going to give you an answer. Um, so this, sorry, who, am I, who was just speaking? Joyce. Joyce, Joyce, thanks, Joyce, for sharing this other activity. Joyce, where on this continuum do you think that activity that you just described falls? Mm. I would say a guided play, maybe. I am tempted to say it is a game. Okay. It's a game where you've got rules that those roles structure and script, just like the one I modeled today, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the kids playing on their own. And so this would be like um, what Diana talked about when she said she read the book and then she played specific games with the kids, right? And we need to keep, and then Diana, Diana actually moved on and she had them playing with Play-Doh but she was still there in scaffolding. So she was still kind of directing a little bit their play, but then of course they had a little bit more freedom. And then in Diana's activity, the kids themselves, it wasn't planned, but the kids themselves actually took over and just ended up making big caterpillars and completely just going off on their own and using the language spontaneously. The difference between um, the guided play and the free play, in my opinion, there was these, these lines are all very blurry, I feel, but in my opinion is the role of the teacher. So if you are directing their play, if you are asking them questions, if you are in there sort of, they're taking the lead, but you're still in there with them directing, then it's not free play yet. Free play is when they're off on their own and you're observing and they're making choices about what they're doing. You might be making sure everyone, well, you're definitely making sure that everyone's safe, you might be giving them meaning or asking meaningful questions about what they're doing so that you can document. You're doing a lot of documentation during free play. This is really different. Now, back to Joyce. Joyce, it sounds to me like that is a game. And I wonder how you could then move that game to make it or to create space there for a free play activity. I wonder how that could become free play. I don't have an answer for you, but I do have that challenge, Joyce. How could you think about, think carefully about the language that they have been using and practicing with you? Where would that naturally emerge in a child's life? Or how can you design um, what I like to call an invitation to play, a prompt? Let me, let me illustrate this a little bit better by going back to my example from the very start of this webinar when I described how I had previously set up a table with lots of arts and craft materials, beautiful colored little loose parts and things that glitter and things that are, you know, ribbons and tape and glue and paint, lots of stuff to make a mess. I'd set up that table, didn't say anything to them, but it was there. And that was all that they needed. I had a big pile of boxes as well. So they had been, I kind of set up, I'd created this context in which they were thinking about boxes. They were thinking about how boxes could be transformed. And there was suddenly, there were some boxes and there were some materials and off they went. So were they, was it completely free? I would like to think that it was completely free, but perhaps with a little bit of, um, little bit of um, encouragement and invitation to play. I think we can start thinking about how we can create these kinds of contexts online as well. 
Um, checking back in with you, Diane, did, Diane, did that answer your question? Yes, yes, it's clear now. I understood the difference. And I, I loved, you know what I loved about your example? I loved that the children actually did feel happy. Children will do this. And a lot of teachers are like, oh, they're so disobedient. Kids will find a way to play. And they can usually invent pretty great games too. So kids will naturally do that. And I love the way you responded by giving them the space in your lesson plan. You're like, no, 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 we're all making food. You've got to be making food with this Play-Doh. You let them, you gave them that freedom to start taking that activity in a different direction. So I love that. Kudos to you. Sylvia, you had your hand up. Would you like to share? Yeah, I uh, just wanted to share. I have this first grade student. She's taking classes online, of course. And we were uh, learning about uh, light and shadows. Uh, so I, I showed her a video with those shadow puppets. And then she d we decided, she asked me if she could do her own theater and I showed her the one I was making here. And then she has been playing at home with her grandma, telling her stories in English. Oh, wow, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, I was really, really happy to, to hear about it. So Sylvia, this is really interesting and it's an idea that I've been toying around with a lot is that maybe, maybe our role as play-based teachers isn't to try and get them playing here in a live lesson at the same time. Maybe what we should be thinking our role of is sort of creating this context, which is so inviting and, and uh, maybe connects with their curiosity or something they're really interested in or gets them really excited about doing something when they get off the screen. I've got a couple of different ideas that I can't wait to share with this group about um, about uh, how I think this might look online. Some things involving dress ups and clothes and different pieces of cloth. I'm having a look over here at the the um, comment section here. I'd love to invite Juliana from Spiritu Santo, Juliana Flores. If you would love to jump on here and talk to us about the loose parts, that would be great. Julie, Juliana? Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Hi, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Hi. <laughs> okay, I'm just trying to move a little bit into a more quiet space. Well, we were talking about this kind of place and I, I'm just completely in love with everything everybody's sharing. Uh, Play-based is, is still something that people need to find a good balance. So I try to offer during my activities, um, um, like in person or not online, the opportunity for the kids to create themselves. So uh, lately I've, I've been doing this. I asked the family to let some pieces of possibilities and let them explore. I can show them, but I can also ask them, what can you make with this? And try to engage this kind of conversation in a more free environment, not so teacher led. That's wonderful. You know, this is really, this idea of loose parts a loose parts collection for those of you who don't would you like to explain what loose parts are juliana well uh, loose parts i think it's a comp like for me it's a universe you have little pieces of different materials that you can simply create anything from uh anything that you want for example yeah. i use lots of pompons uh cloths uh, TNT pieces and other things. Uh, uh, Bottle tops, toilet rolls. Toilet um, rolls. Um, what else? We can, 
Yeah, like any, basically loose part is the possibility for you to create a puzzle out of basically everything that you have at home, which is very uh, uh, easy for us to adapt during these quarantine times because the kids, the kids are at home. So you have Lego, Lego pieces, you have uh, like fabrics and different kind of papers. Uh, pompons usually uh, is not something that very common, but you can offer, or you can suggest the parents. This is something that I did. I sent out a kit with pompons and popsicle sticks for the parents because I know that I would use it. So that, it was, I love the idea of sending out a kit. Yeah, um, th yeah, this is good because I can think about the possibilities and I can offer. So I, I, it, it's so overwhelming for parents as well. I, I'm saying this because I'm a mom parent, yeah. and we, we are in a very hectic kind of routine. So everything that to make easier, uh, it's yes. going to make the lesson and the, the, this connection with family is more natural. Yes, absolutely. So I'm going to jump on this idea that Juliana had, and I'm going to say, obviously, we can't all be putting together kits. I wish my child was in your class. I would love to receive some loose parts. <laughs> Lots we of can't be doing that. It's extremely expensive, but maybe we could be encouraging uh, parents to start building up their own loose parts kit. When you realize that almost anything can be loose parts, it really isn't an expensive venture. I mean, wine corks are great loose parts. Toothpicks, make sure they're age appropriate people, of course, um, but bottle tops, you can get bottle tops. I've, I've, I was that person who used to go around to restaurants and ask them to save the wine, the, the corks from the wine bottles and the bottle tops from the soft drink bottles for me. Um, you know, I have been, had amazing things donated to the school, like um, cutoffs of fabric and, oh, I love me yeah. some loose parts. And maybe that's what we can start encouraging um, parents to start doing. Cotton balls, they probably have a lot of stuff. Now, yeah. having a look at this, thank you so much for sharing, Julia. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Having a real quick look at some of these other comments, I want to give a shout out to Kathy. You all know Kathy from It's, um, it's Playtime English on Instagram. Beautiful ideas. And Kathy, what she's describing here in her comment was about teaching stories about animals, listening to some songs. And when the students arrived, she prepared what we call an invitation to play. Or what is also known, this, these are great terms for you to start looking for on Pinterest. Look for small world play. Um, so she'd set up bins, plastic bins, with sand and rocks and different natural items from nature. And of course, some of these animal toys and what do you think happens when children arrive uh, to class and they have these materials out and available for them to access and play with freely? Well, naturally, they're going to start diving in there, creating, building, putting things together, taking things apart, playing their own little games. And if they've had enough exposure to the language, you will observe, you will notice them starting to um, use the language as they play. Children, I feel, have a very strong connection to place and objects, and that's been one of the tricks that I've used. And I'm going to jump in and look at Anna Carolina here. Anna, Anna Carol has joined me a couple of times on Instagram already. You probably know her from her profile, um, my teacher profile. Um, now, she's talking about how one day she'd been using specific materials, and in the next lesson, she just left them out for the kids. Now, every time this has happened to me, every time I've been playing a game over and over again using very specific materials, they become almost like a trigger for kids. So when they see them, in their mind, they start thinking about the game that we play. They associate those materials with the game that they've played or the song that they've sung. Um, and the language in English that goes with it. So that's a really easy way I've found to encourage that free play um, to include L2, which in our case is English. Um, so that's another really great tip there. Uh, I'll give you another example. What's the time, Mr. Wolf? When I introduced that game, I had this EVA, this craft foam headpiece with these big teeth, this wolf teeth and this, these ears. And the wolf would always wear that. What do you think happened when I left that out for kids uh, during free playtime? The hat would go straight on and would have 
games of What's the Time, Mr. Wolf in English happening, um, even their own little versions of that game, but lots of rich, meaningful, spontaneous language production that they're choosing to do. So thank you all very much for all of the sharing that you've been doing. I'm gonna wrap up this session really quickly now so we finish on time. Um, getting back to where we were, I just wanna talk really quickly about what stops teachers from using free play. Because I know the struggle is real. I have been speaking to the community and what I keep hearing are the same obstacles happening over and over again. I think there's a lot of reasons why teachers might shy away from it. First of all, I think that teachers don't really understand what it is, free play, because it's something that a lot of us from um, our generation haven't uh, experienced as learners themselves. Um, but also sometimes it's due to the pressures to cover everything in the course book and you feel like I'll need a whole lesson for free play. I don't think you do. I think you can have moments of free play every now and again. And I think not only can you, you must, you must. Other teachers worry that students will revert to Portuguese when left to play freely in English. And you know what? They probably will. I think it's completely natural with when we're talking about learners who have a very low level of uh, English proficiency for them to use L1 as their play. But I guarantee you, if you have done a really strong, successful teacher-led play activities and you have carefully, cleverly designed a free play invitation to play or you've got the same materials there or you've set it up nicely, enough language support first and then given them this opportunity to do what they want, they are going to be uh, producing language as well as the L1 and the L2 all mixed in together. I've seen these examples myself. I know that this happens. And let's face it, wouldn't you rather know what they can produce or not? Isn't this what we want students to be doing? Isn't this a, a test for ourselves? If all students can do is recite one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or tell you what's on a flashcard, or recite back to you memorized phrases, is this good enough? I'm gonna say no. Um, there's also this prevailing idea that the teacher should be at the center of all classroom activities. And even in these learner-centered classrooms, I feel like the teacher is still dominant. This is something that I've struggled with as well. Um, learning to take a step back, and that's not me slacking off. In fact, when children are at free play, I'm incredibly active, I'm documenting, I'm observing, I'm making records of what I see, um, and I'm using this as valuable evidence to help me plan better lessons in the future. And I think teachers also believe that parents or school management would never approve of free play. And this is the hardest one to overcome, I know that. And um, if you're in a school that really still believes that rote memorization and recall of information are effective, um, if they have not realized the critical role that play that play has in building young children's development and learning, then I would consider looking for another job. No, I know that's not, <laughs> I know that's not always possible. Seriously though, the situation that I was in was a learning community that was like that. Um, parents were only interested in how quickly their little two, three, four year olds would learn to read and write. And by five, they all had to be literate, um, which seems absurd to me. But I overcame this. And how do they overcome it was, of course, by building really strong partnerships with these parents, by being present, by engaging with parents, by inviting them in to see what was going on, by showing them results, by documenting things through video, audio, um, photographs, little anecdotes that I'd write down. I'd show them. I would invite them in to, to participate in my lessons so that they could see what it was that they were doing and the results spoke for themselves. Um, I'm absolutely positive that all and any challenges can be overcome and free play can and must be integrated into any good language program for children of any proficiency. I hope that tonight's session has given you a lot of food for thought. I hope you feel a little bit clearer about what it is at least that I refer to when I'm talking about play-based learning and play itself. I encourage you all to check out these references. I'm going to make these available with the links that you can click on in our Facebook group. And of course, I want to give you a big thank you for being here and showing so much interest in this topic 
on a Monday night, so late as this, it's just, I can't tell you how much I love being part of this community and how thankful I am for all of you for being here tonight. I hope you enjoyed that webinar. It's actually part of a series of asynchronous classes that you can take when participating in my collaborative lesson planning week. I've created this group in response to the overwhelming demand from teachers who've told me that they have students who simply won't engage. And these kids are often becoming distracted and disruptive. And we all know that when that happens, teaching becomes really difficult. Stress levels rise and you can very quickly find yourself losing motivation and struggling to enjoy teaching the way you should. I think that the solution to many of these problems begins with learning how to create a really good lesson. Um, that's why I've created this group for young learner teachers. The idea is to help you get better and faster at planning the kinds of lessons that children love. Really, my aim is to have you finish feeling confident that you know how to structure your lessons in a way that engages, motivates, and creates a positive learning environment. Most importantly, this course is all about changing the way you understand the lesson planning process. So what can you expect from this course? You're going to learn how to structure your lessons better. You will learn how to design meaningful learning outcomes. I'm gonna share all of my favorite classroom activities. You'll get feedback from me on one of your lessons and you'll also get access to the recordings of all the sessions. And most excitingly, you're going to contribute to an ebook of lessons that are gonna be shared around the world. So that's an incredible amount of content and an amazing community of colleagues who will help you feel confident planning and teaching lessons for young learners. Would you like to join us? If you would, get in contact to find out the dates of the next Collaborative Lesson Planning Week, or you can start straight away by taking the series of asynchronous classes. Follow the link in the description to find out more about these two options. Thanks, and I'll see you online real soon.